Good morning, church. Now it's official. I love you guys. You're awesome. Well, last week, Neil started our new series, and we called it Homecoming. And he did a great job last week. I was so proud of him. Neil, I'm so proud of you. It was awesome. But he described it real well. He said, like, sometimes as a preacher you come to talk about certain topics and everything inside of you resonates and wants to cry about it. But it's such a, <laughs> such a hard reality to express verbally that it, you feel like you jump on this merry-go-round and you, you, you hang on to that for a while and then you pew, and you try again. So I'll try again today, just like Neil did last time. So last time... He led us to ask ourselves a question. What comes to mind when we think of this word home or homecoming? And all of us agreed that a whole range of very powerful and positive emotions and feelings and images come to mind, are invoked by that, right? A soldier who fights somewhere knowing that he's got a home he fights for. A student that comes from the summer vacation and everybody is welcoming him and cooking the best like meal that he loves. All of these things. And the amazing thing, another paradox that he pointed out to us was like, he asked us the question like, how do you know this? Because a lot of us have never experienced that or experienced very little of those things in our life growing up. Yet we know what home is supposed to be. Somehow we know. We have this innate knowledge. And it's because it's written in our DNA. Because any good relationship when you feel accepted, loved unconditionally, when you feel at rest and relaxed to be yourself, if you don't have to prove people your value, if you don't try to be validated by people, you're just breathing easily because you're accepted. You don't have to strive. You're loved, cherished, honored, validated. Any, anything that sounds and feels like that, it's just an echo of the original design, which is God himself. Paul, in chapter 3 of Ephesians, prays, he says, And for this reason, I bow my knees before the Father from whom every family in heaven and on earth is named. <laughs> anyway, that's the general theme of homecoming, right? So, we are created by this, for this relationship. We this is our natural environment to live in and function at the best of our uh, uh, capacity. Yet we find ourselves not in this environment. Just like fish when it's taken out of the water and flopping on the grass, you can see that it's alive, it's existing, but it's not doing well. Most of us are not doing well in life because we don't have an experience of this home. And the good news is that Jesus has come to brought us home. And the good news is it's not for when you die. Hallelujah, by and by. It's for now. And I'm going to talk about it today. And I'll try my best to unpack some of it. So deep inside we know the true, what true home is, yet in our lives we experience homelessness. So instead of unconditional love, we experience a lot of conditions. Uh, instead of being just celebrated as a person, we constantly try to accommodate and to fit and to blend in and not to be rejected, right? A lot of inner, inner turmoil is produced by not experiencing true home in our lives. And even if you had glimpses of that wonderful home, if you were lucky and blessed to have a good mom and dad and good loving family, you kind of lose it as you grow old. You step into the world of adults that fight, that hate, right? It doesn't feel like home. It doesn't 
it's not home and why does it happen well because of the diseased darkened minds that we inherited from our ancestors you see the theologians talk about the fall of mankind Adam and Eve but the thing is God never changed Adam and Eve changed God never changed his mind about us Adam and Eve did they contracted this disease not when they ate the fruit but when they begin to swallow the lies about who God is and unfortunately it wasn't just a stomach bug it was a devastating terminal stage disease that became a hereditary disease that was passed on to every single human Dennis Kozlov Karen Phil Shank by the way Phil Shank one of the father of the house is right here why don't you greet him him and his family and his wife Alice I mean I'm speaking for those online who don't know Phil Phil took this church to its highest I I'm gonna take a minute just to honor him okay he took this church to the highest attendance attendance wise I think right it was a very influential church back at the day in Springfield here's the irony God called him out of a very successful church ministry guess where Russia as a as a missionary not just Russia but a place that I as Russian would never have gone to it's a dangerous plan, uh, place Muslim place out of a lot of civilization amenities into the mountains of villages out there in Caucasus mountains he sent him to Russia and years later he sent a Russian dude to come here and we didn't even know each other like if you can't see God here and his irony and his smile something's wrong with you <laughs> anyway sorry for distraction let's let's uh, get back to our message so this disease is this disease is horrible disease so immediately instantly when Adam and Eve believed the lies about God's good intentions for them about God's nature about God's heart they lost the freedom to to be loved and to love back they lost the freedom to know and to be known they lost the freedom to expose themselves without fear they got filled with fear insecurity angst shame they started experiencing this torment inside and this torment tinted their vision of everything including God they begin to project to project this inner torment to God himself and they began to be afraid of God and they started what did they start to do running and hiding and that's the history of mankind in a short nutshell hiding running disguising ourselves camouflaging trying to appear a certain way before each other and most worst of all before God right so I remember this dream that I had as a kid I was like six years old and I still remember the dream I, I grew up in the Soviet Union horror movies didn't exist back then but I saw a horror movie in my dream in that dream I was a little kid as I was like five or six years old and it was in the middle of the night and I was in a huge empty hospital no one is there and I'm hiding and the reason I'm hiding is because I know that there are two people and another two people there and these two people are one of them is my mom and her friend and another one is another set of my mom and her friend and they look absolutely identical there is no way I can distinguish here's the problem one of them loves me and lo is looking for me frantically to save me another one wants to kill me and is looking for me too and here I am hiding and every time I see them appearing I don't know which one is it 
Do you know that this is the description? That's my child psyche processed probably some of the glimpses of love that I received from my mom and some of the glimpses that I'm a problem in her life. And do you know that that's what's happening in the psyche of every human being when they try to build relationship with God? So Neil last time introduced these two prop, props. And for those uh, who listen to this message and don't see it online, on my left side I have one chair facing the audience and it says G-O-D, spells like God. And it represents the throne of God, the king, the judge, whatever. And another one is the circle of chairs facing to each other. And they have labels here on my uh, left side, Son, Father, Holy Spirit. And last time Neil began to talk about it. So why do we bring this here and why do we talk about it is because there is a good news. In our state of homelessness, in our state of darkened minds that is not capable of seeing God clearly as He is, God said resounding no to the state of homelessness and firm yes to, to our homecoming. And it, it, it became possible in Jesus. So let me tell you my working definition of homecoming as we develop this series. Listen, here's what I wrote. The homecoming is when we are brought back into God as our home. And when God is brought back into us so that we would become a mutual dwelling place forever not when you die now not in your mind in your heart in your soul even in your body in your experience now in 2024 in Springfield Ohio or wherever you live if you watch us online this is the good news this is the gospel <laughs> So, and this is why Jesus has come to make this happen, to save us from this homelessness and to bring us back home. Luke 19.10, Jesus gives a very short description of his mission. He said, for the Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. That's us guys, we're lost. You can't find the way back, you're lost. But he said no to this state of, to this condition of being lost. Am I the only one getting excited about it? I love preaching because it works better than coffee for me. So let me tell you something. One of the primary, and today I'm going to be focusing on, uh, on the parable that is known as a parable of the prodigal son. But before I do that, I'm going to do a few comments. One of the primary ways Jesus heals our diseased minds is by unveiling to us God for what he really is as he truly is when he does this when when Jesus begins to unveil what God is and who God is his being his heart his passion we begin to change this change is called repentance we need to clean up a lot of words that religious folks tinted and like marred Repentance is not just a remorseful, artificially engineered sense of regret that you are such a bad, 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 bad person. Repentance is when you did not see something and all of a sudden you see something. And as you see something, you are ushered into a new experience and your whole being is changed. Your heart, your mind, your attitude, your thoughts about the world, about God, about yourself. That's repentance. And Christian living is a living of continuous repentance because we begin to know God more and more. Okay, so, so he revealed the reality of God from within God. That's, it's really hard to express in words. How could he do that? Well, he declared he could do it because he was equal with God. In fact, he, he claimed that he himself was God. Human being making very bold declarations about himself. I remember I visited a 
prison in Russia and we were preaching the gospel there. And there was a tough guy who everything was afraid of. And he was a Muslim. And we talked about Jesus. And he said, like, I believe that Jesus was a prophet of God. I believe Jesus was a very, very amazing, amazing person. Crystal clear, honest person of integrity. But he wasn't the son of God. He wasn't God. I said, brother, if you read carefully the Gospel of John and all the statements that Jesus made about himself, you will have to come to a conclusion that he was a liar or he was a lunatic or he was what he claimed to be. He, he didn't know what to do with that. Anyway, and maybe some of you are struggling with that. And you should. So before I get into the text of the Gospel of Luke, chapter 15, I want to point out to two things that is very important for you to understand. Two primary revelations that are absolutely essential to Christian faith and make Christian faith unique and different from anything else. From Islam, from Judaism. Everything hinges on these two revelations. The church history called it doctrines. That's the problem. A lot of us know the doctrine right here. We never let it become a revelation down here. So the first one is the unique nature of the person of Jesus Christ. Fully human and fully God. He is Yahweh. Wow. <laughs> I'm sorry for yelling. I love yelling when it's important. <laughs> fully God and fully man. And the second revelation is the revelation that he came to reveal about God. The revelation that God is a triune God. It's not just a dogma. It's not just a doctrine. It's a, it's a revelation. Yes, the word Trinity, don't worry. I know the history. I know the theology. The word Trinity is not in the Bible. The word Trinity is just a term that was coined by, by church fathers within the first three centuries of the Christian faith because they didn't have a term. They have to come up with a term to explain, to label this complex reality that Jesus came to reveal. So he brought the unique internal knowledge of God. You see what was happening. You will say, Dennis, well, Jesus claimed this unique internal intrinsic knowledge of God as his father. He never referred to God as God or like king or judge. He always said, Father, my father, my father, my father, my father. So he claimed this unique knowledge and he would say scandalous things. He would say nobody knows the father except for the son. I'm going to read the scripture. So you would say, Dennis, but how can it be? Because by the time Jesus has come, there was so much knowledge about God. There were so many revelations about God. There were so many words spoken and so much ink spilled about God. Yes, all those things were glimpses of the knowledge about God and external attributes about God. Things that God does. Things that he functions as, so to speak, hats that he's wearing sometimes. All of this external knowledge created this image of the very powerful, unique ruler of the universe, creator of the universe, who created everything but nobody really knows his heart. You have guesses, educated guesses. And here comes Jesus into the society that is that is built around this knowledge, that is built around trying to please this God, G-O-D, this remote, high, elevated deity. And Jesus comes and he says, this is mostly a lie. What? How do you know this? Youngster, how did it, whimper snapper? I keep messing up this word. You're not even 50. You haven't seen neighbor. What, what are you talking about? So Jesus in Matthew 11, 25, 27, he says, at that time, Jesus, just an example. At that time, Jesus declared, I thank you, Father. Father. I thank you, Father. Father. Abba. Daddy. Papa. I thank you, Papa. Yes, you are Lord of heaven and earth, but for me, you're Papa. 
that you have hidden these things from the wise and the under and understanding and revealed them to little children yes father for such was your gracious will another translation says for it pleased you profoundly you were pleased to do that all things have been handed over to me all things have been all handed over to me by my father and no one knows the son except the father and no one knows the father except the son and anyone anyone to whom the son chooses to reveal him wow <laughs> so you see before Jesus came much knowledge but this knowledge was external knowledge about God listen this external revelations about God and all the hats that he's wearing will not heal your mind and heart and will not bring you home well as I, as I was running this message uh, we, we have something that we practice sermon prep we, we we prepare our message and we run it by number of people we trust and one of the brothers suggested like hey you can say that like God has a house with multiple empty beds that he wants to fill sounds good right the problem is if you don't have revelation of this of the inside of God you might end up in a huge eternal orphanage if you don't know the heart if you don't know the inside of God so here was the thing Jesus came to bring the knowledge not a, not about God but the knowledge of God how because he himself was God and he came to us wow well we'll talk about it later we'll talk about it much we'll talk about incarnation when the word that was in the beginning with God by the way the word that's the beginning of the gospel of uh, John we don't have it on the screen it just you know in the beginning was the word in the beginning was the word and the word was with God with God and the word was towards God and the word was God the word is an expression of internal reality and the word is a communication so before anything and everything was there there was a communication of love do you hear me this is the womb that gave birth to you this is eternal womb that gave birth and creation to everything and everyone with a plan in mind and we will be talking about this plan first few messages we'll be talking about the being of God then we'll be talking about the heart of God then we'll be talking about the mission of God to fulfill this plan and you know who is the focal point of this plan you my friend individually and now I think it's a good time to so you see you can be adopted by this God image but you can only be birthed by this adoption is in the Bible but it implies the restoration of your rights as a son but the birth is missed by so many people when you become a partaker of the divine nature you're birthed you're born out of eternal relationship of love and into eternal relationship of love and this is my friend is a homecoming every time you say genuinely Jesus I believe you I need you this happens I meet Christians all the time and I ask them how are you doing and if we start talking about their spiritual life I begin like how, how are you doing how is your relationship with the Lord and a lot of them say you know what they say they say I'm trying what are you trying what are you trying if you're trying my friend you're still there you know why Jesus got killed by religious folks because they were first ones that began to realize what he's saying they were picking up stones and say no 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 and he said why are you trying to kill me for the good things that I've done in the name of the Lord they said no but because you make yourself equal with God you claim things that nobody has ever claimed and again we are in front of the same choice he is either a lunatic a deceived man or he is what he says he is fully God 
and fully man. This is the point when we are united with him. Anyway, gosh, I have 12 minutes to run through, <laughs> through the parable of the prodigal son, chapter 15. Well, first I'm going to give you a quote by Baxter Kruger. That's the theologian that is well respected and especially respected by Neil and I. And we were blessed to actually meet him in person last year. And it was wonderful. Let me read this to you. To believe in Trinity means that we believe that God is a relational being and always has been and always will be. The doctrine of Trinity means that relationship, that fellowship, that togetherness, that sharing, that self-giving, other-centeredness are not afterthoughts with God. But the deepest truth about the being of God. The Father is not consumed with Himself. He loves the Son and the Spirit. And the Son is not riddled with narcissism. He loves His Father and the Spirit. And the Spirit is not preoccupied with Himself and His own glory. The Spirit loves the Father and the Son, giving, not taking, other-centeredness, not self-centeredness, sharing, not hoarding, <laughs> are the fire that rockets of God and, oh, sorry, not the hoarding are what fire the rockets of God and lie at the very center of God's existence as Father, Son, and Spirit. When Christianity says God, it says relationship. It says self-giving. Love expressing itself in boundless fellowship and joyous untold unity. It doesn't say self-centered. It doesn't say removed. It doesn't say distant. It doesn't say detached. It doesn't say indifferent or austere. It doesn't say lonely or sad or bored or in need. When Christianity says God, it says Father, Son, and Spirit existing in relationship of acceptance and delight and self-giving love. A relationship that is so true so rich, so real, so good, so open that the only way we can speak of it is to say that God is three yet utterly one. You see, if you only have the knowledge and the highest revelation that Israel had back then was Shema Israel. Adonai Eloheinu Adonai Ehad. Listen Israel, the Lord your God is God that is one. That means he's unique, he's above all, he's holy, but nobody knows what's inside of God. What he is like within. There was one qualified to tell us, he himself. <laughs> and he does it. So we will be talking about it. We will be talking about the plan of God, the mission of God, that every person of Trinity was involved. The Father was there with the Son. The Son was there with the Father. The Spirit was there with them. And Jesus said, when I do everything that I'm supposed to do, the day will come when the Comforter will come. And on that day, you will know that I am in the Father, and the Father is in me, and I am in you. Amen. The tragedy that a lot of Christians never got to experience that day. Because they're stuck here. Do you understand that? And a lot of us are still there. And we're trying. In vain. Okay, now, the challenge of a champion. Try to go through the chapter 15 of Luke in eight minutes and even comment on that. I'll try. Maybe I'll skip a lot of it. Maybe I'll let Neil continue next week. I don't know. We'll see. So, chapter 15 of Luke shows us the reality of this homelessness and shows us the process of recovering from this homelessness, coming home, homecoming. So I'll begin from verse 1. I'm going to read the whole thing first. I'll stop at verse 1 and 2. I'm going to read the whole thing. And then I'll just probably focus just on the prodigal son parable. Okay, chapter 15, beginning from verse 1. Now the tax collectors and sinners were all drawing near to him. And the Pharisees and the scribes grumbled, saying, This man receives sinners and eats with them. That's the setting. That's important to stop here to understand. Here's Jesus, and here are two groups of people labeled by these two names. One, 
camp is called tax collectors and sinners, scumbags in the lights, in the eyes of the people of Israel who believed in their God. Because they didn't care for God's law. They brought all the curses upon the land of Israel. The Romans were ruling them because of these guys. And some of them were such a scumbags that they even started collaborating with Romans, tax collectors, very corrupt people, blood-sucking people. They were hated and despised. And in the eyes of those religious folks, the second group uh, that are called Pharisees and scribes, these guys are the problem. These guys were dedicated, I mean, the, the, the religious folks, they were dedicated to their knowledge of God. As much as they knew, they wanted to keep things well and straight with God. And to keep things well and straight with God, meaning to keep yourself clean and separate yourself from anything that would even smell unclean and filthy and defiling. And this was, these guys, these tax collectors and sinners, they were pure defilement. And Jesus, talking about God... Instead of doing this, separating himself, he was welcoming those guys to an extent of eating with them. You know, eating was a big deal back then, even now. But back then, it was the, an intimate act of accepting somebody fully and endorsing somebody. If you eat with someone, you declare to the world, I'm one with them. I identify myself with them. That's what Jesus was doing. So that's important to understand. This is the setting. And then... Jesus looks at the setting and he gives them a response. And the response comes in the form of three parables. The same topic, just unfolding more and more. And I'm going to run through the text now. So he told them this parable. What man of you, he's explaining to these folks what's happening with these folks. He said, what man of you having a hundred sheep, if he has lost one of them, does not leave the 99 in the open country and Go after the one that is lost until he finds it. And when he has found it, he lays it on his shoulders, rejoicing. And when he comes home, he calls together his friends and his neighbors, saying to them, Rejoice with me, for I have found my sheep that was lost. Just so I tell you, there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents, changes their mind and their understanding, their heart, than over 99 righteous persons who need no repentance. He says, you guys are getting angry, but you, do underst you don't understand what's happened. What's happening is I'm on a mission of seeking and saving. And these people are drawn to me. That's a successful indication of the successful mission. You know what it means? God is ecstatically dancing right now. And you're, being, you're getting mad at the same time. So he continues, parable of the lost coin. Or what woman having ten silver coins, if she loses one coin, does not light up a lamp and sweep the house and seek diligently until she finds it. She takes everything in the house apart. In search of one coin. And by the way, the main thing of the first two parables is like, God is God of nations, right? But He looks at you individually. No one comes to God as a bunch of people. You come into the womb of eternal love. Personally. Individually. Every, <laughs> every person of the Trinity looks into your eyes with love and smiles. That's that what makes you a person. That's what makes every person a person. The personhood of God, inside of God. That was a distraction, but a good one. <laughs> so he finally comes and he says, so I tell you, there is, there is joy before the angels of God over one sinner who repents. And then he comes to the jewel of this, uh, of this chapter, the parable of a prodigal son. And I suggest to rename it in your mind and in your heart. It's not a, it's not a, parable of a prodigal son it's a parable of totally misunderstood father listen i'm going to read it quickly and he said there was a man who had two sons and the young of younger of them said to the father father give me the share of the property that is coming to me and he divided his property between them not many days later the younger son gathered all he had and took a journey into a far country and there he squandered his property in reckless living. 
And when he had spent everything, a severe famine arose in that country, and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to one of the citizens of that country who sent him into his fields to feed pigs. And he was longing to be fed with pods that the pigs ate, and no one gave him anything. But when he came to himself, he said, how many of my father's hired servants have more than enough bread, but I perish here with hunger. I will rise and go to my father, and I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you, and I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Treat me as one of your hired servants. And he arose, and he came to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and felt compassion and ran and embraced him and kissed him. And the son said to him, the son is still trying to stick with his plan. Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father, he interrupted him. But the father said to his servants, bring quickly the best robe and put it on him and put a ring on his hand and shoes on his feet and bring the fattened calf and kill it and let us eat and celebrate. For this my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. And they began to celebrate. Remember, Jesus is explaining those two camps of people what's happening. Now the older brother was in the field. And as he came and drew near to the house, he heard the music. He heard the dancing. And he called one of the servants and asked him, what are these things? What, what do these things mean? And he said to him, your brother has come. And your father has killed the fattened calf because he has received him back safe and sound. But this older brother, he was angry. And he refused to go in. His father came out and entreated him. His father came out of the celebration and entreated him but he answered his father look dad these many years I've served you and I never disobeyed your command I was the most reliable I has never been flaky I was a good good son and I've been doing everything to prove that I'm a good son to you dad how come, Dad? How come, Dad? How come, Dad? He doesn't see the father's heart. Dude, I don't know. I hope you're getting it. You never gave me a young goat that I might celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours came, who has devoured your property with prostitutes, you killed the fattened calf for him and he said to him son son hello son you are always with me all that is mine is yours you want to go goat is yours you want a calf calf is yours you want a holiday holiday is yours you want a vacation vacation is yours all that is mine is yours you're my son what are you talking about But it was fitting to celebrate and be glad. For this your brother was dead and he's alive. He was lost and he is found. Oh, praise the Lord. Can you hear the heart of the Father that Jesus came to reveal? Not omniscient, omnipresent, judge of the universe, vengeful and wrathful and whatever. It's, it's a different kind of knowledge. I'm, I'm wrapping it up, guys. The musician's about to come. But I want to I make it practical to you. I'm just unpacking to you what it means to begin to experience homecoming in your life. Your Christian faith begins 
when you experience homecoming. You exhale, you relax, you're embraced, you're loved, you're cherished. So just few things from this, from this, from this parable. And I have a lot to share from this parable. Neil has a lot to share from this parable. We don't have time to share from this parable. So I'll, I will just say a few things. In verse 14, well, first of all, the younger brother represents those sinners and tax collectors. They kind of realized it's not worth it. Trying to please G.O.D. cannot be done. And they only have one lifetime. So why waste your life? And that's the logic of so many people. I said, like, why church? Why God? Why Bible? You know why? And they're right. If your church, if your Bible is like this, it's a waste of time. So I pray we would never become church like this. I pray our church will continue to be what many people testify. They say we come and we felt home. Because we preach home. We preach God who is your home. And who provided a way for you to come home. So this guy, the younger guy, he rebelled. Do you know what he said? He offended the father immensely by saying, give me my part of inheritance. You know what it means? This is mine by the right when you die. So why don't we, why don't we, why wait? Let's reenact your death and funeral. Do you hear that? So he basically buried his father and left. And the father was, he, he didn't say anything. He did what his son wanted him. So he, being in the far country, he hit the rock bottom. And he came to the end of himself, to the end of any joy and satisfaction. And he finally came to a very hard realization. And I hope you all and I, I think I have come to this realization. I hope I'm secure. I hope all of you will come to this realization. It's not a pleasant realization. He came to this hard realization. I am homeless nobody who is not worth pig's pods. <laughs> My search for self-autonomy and self-validation has brought me to a bitter realization. I do not have any intrinsic value in me for this world. Do you know that nobody really cares about you? That's true. I mean, some people do, I know. That's good. But o overall, even your family that loves you, when you die in a couple of generations, nobody will ever remember your name. That's a hard realization. You're not an eternal being by yourself. You're a homeless nobody. Not worth pig's food. But if you come to the Father... You are an eternal child of God. Love. Having an intrinsic value. Where? In you. No, in the heart of the Father. He wants to celebrate you. This guy, when he came home, totally ruined, devastated, uh, having nothing, hitting the rock bottom, becoming, finally realizing that he's nobody. He came and he came up with this plan. And I have to make a confession. I, a number of years ago, I taught that I taught and used this story as a proper way to repent. Bull crap. <laughs> he was just trying to get his food and his shelter. And he hoped this plan works. Father caught him in the middle of that. He, he interrupted his rehearsed speech and he said, Please stop every productive activity. We're stopping today. We're killing. We're slaughtering the calf. We're going to celebrate. And all of a sudden, he's sitting clean, dressed, having a signet ring with a like family credit card signature or something like that. Experiencing this lavish love of God that is absolutely unattached to anything that he has ever done. Good or bad but enjoying the pure gift of sonship that flows from the heart of the Father. This is the beginning of his life. This is the beginning of homecoming. And my hope and my prayer that somehow you stay with us long enough, even if you live somewhere, I don't care, this will stuck with you. This will stick with you. And you will begin to experience homecoming. All right. I went over time. I apologize. 
So let me pray right now before we start worshiping. I pray for the homecoming to begin in your life. And all striving to deserve something and prove something and get validated will cease. So, can we pray right now together? Bow your heads, close your eyes, let's pray. Repeat after me. Jesus, I love you. Jesus, I need you. Continue to draw me to yourself. Continue to reveal the heart of the Father to me. Father, Papa, Daddy, continue to reveal yourself to me and your love for me. Spirit, thank you for actively participating in my life. Bring the fullness of homecoming into every area of my life. Heal my orphan heart with your love, with your joy over me. Penetrate me and permeate me with this joy and peace of homecoming and make me a beacon of hope for people around me. Use me, Father, to bring people home. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's worship.